So, dear students, we have come to the very heart of our semester. We are now going to delve into the world of common stock valuation. Because, oh boy, there was a lot of stuff to learn in Chapter 5, wasn't there? About stocks, all different characteristics, about dividends, about about uh, P.E. ratios and, uh, and other ratios and and uh, the, the, the markets and the strategies and the types of stocks. Yes, you need to know all that. But here, dear students, we're going to actually figure out what is it worth? And we're going to find out it ain't easy to determine. <laughs> but, 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 we use a, a couple of guiding principles from very smart people. So on slide number one, you'll see a couple of quotes. One is from a mutual fund manager who I think has recently retired, but um, Greg Ireland, and he was one of the he was a, one of the mutual fund managers of one of my favorite funds, and he says value matters. You ignore value at your peril, and sure enough, when you've been working in the industry for over thirty five years, you find times when people throw caution to the wind and bid up the prices and you have to say to yourself okay am i going to follow them maybe maybe not and then we have some wisdom from sure sir arthur conan doyle through his infamous famous character uh, sherlock holmes it is a capital mistake to theorize before one has data yes indeed it is dear students we are going to arm ourselves with lots of data and then throw it all away. <laughs> Stick with us. Let's get started. Slide number two. Stock valuation is the process by which the underlying value of a stock is established on the basis of its forecasted risk and return performance. At any given time, the price of a share of common stock depends on investors' expectations about the future behavior of the security of the stock, of the company. In other words, what's going to happen in the future? Well, that's the problem, right? Do <laughs> a fundamental assertion of finance holds the value of a stock is based on the present value of its future cash flows. And in, in terms of Companies, we're talking about earnings, right? The cash flows. The worth of a company is primarily based on the earnings the company will produce in the future. But if we knew what was going to happen in the future, it would not be called the future, would it? Indeed, right? That's where the problem lies. You can look at the past. Yes, the past is history, and, and we can see what happened. And often in hindsight, it makes perfect sense. But when you're trying to look towards the future, hmm, things get a little tricky, don't they? Prediction is difficult, especially about the future. Slide number three. The most fundamental influence on stock prices is the level and duration of the future growth of earnings and dividends. However, future earnings growth is not easily estimated, even by market professionals. Now, this is... Uh, a very famous professor, Burton Malkiel, who wrote one of the books that you should read, folks. It's a great book. It's called A Random Walk Down Wall Street. He was involved in much of the research that uh, led to uh, index funds, right? They said that people can't do a good job. And then, of course, he, he, he skewers the fundamental analysts, which is what we're doing now. And he skewers the technical analysts. And then he skewers his group, the, uh, the, um, the random walk folks. And so he's, he's a lot of fun to read. But, but in other words, what's going to happen in the future? But the problem is, we don't know. <laughs> so if someone were to ask you, what is the most important factor in determining the future value of a company? In a few words, you could say future earnings. Or you could say future dividends, right? Some, some companies uh, pay a lot of dividends and people buy them just for the dividends. And other companies don't pay any dividends, but we're still looking at what's happening to their earnings in the future. But do any of us know what is going to happen in the future? No. So is valuing stock going to be easy? No. 
Yeah, wait till you see what we're up against. Slide number four. We are going to be doing security analysis. Some people call it fundamental analysis, and we'll discuss fundamental analysis uh, as, we, as we go through these next two chapters. And then we'll take a look at the other major uh, type of analysis called technical analysis, where you don't look at the company itself. Uh, security analysis is the process of gathering and organizing information and then using it to determine the value of a share of common stock. And what we're looking for is the intrinsic value, the underlying or inherent value of a stock as determined by security analysis. The question is, which security analysis methods or measures does one use? Which ones do we use to determine the for the intrinsic value of a company. Do we look at future dividends, uh, potential capital appreciation, the price earnings ratio, the other financial ratios that we'll take a look at in our next chapter, P past price performance, technical analysis, the amount of the risk, value is in the eye of the beholder. And it, it reminds me of the, the, the story of the, 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 the blind men who were all asked to describe an elephant and each one looked at a different part of the elephant and said, you know, they, they described the part that they were looking at with their hands, you know, however, however they were looking at it. Uh, and it's the same way. Some people look at certain things and other people look at other things and you come up with wildly different valuations. Slide number five. Here we are. Finally, finally, my apologies. I should have waited until we got to the slide before we try to define fundamental analysis. This is what we're going to be doing in, in uh, we've already done a little bit in chapter five. We're going to be doing a lot. That's all we're going to do today and this and then and in this, this chapter and then the next chapter. The fundamental analysis is the examination of a firm's accounting statements and other financial and economic information to assess the economic economic value of a company stock. So some of the examples of some of the fundamentals, the competitive position of the company. Is it a, is it a, um, a Coca-Cola or is it a Pepsi-Cola or a Monster Cola? Well, they, don't, they just call it Monster, right? Is it a Visa, a MasterCard or is it a Discover card right? or American Express? The growth prospects for company and its market. What, what do we expect the company to grow? What do we expect the market to grow? The profit margins and company's earnings. How much does it take them to make that money? And how much can they make off of that? What assets are available? What's the st capital structure, which is a fancy way of saying how much debt do they have and how much do they own of the company? Simply put, the value of a stock is influenced by the performance of the company that issued the stock. Now, this makes perfect sense. I mean, you would you would expect this to be what we would use to do our valuation techniques, right? And our and our predictions. Well, dear students, there's a whole other type of analysis called technical analysis, where they basically throw all this stuff out and look at little squiggles on a screen. And we'll see that later on. I will tell you my bias up front so you know, so you don't have to try to infer it and don't, don't, you know, don't bother, but because I'll tell it to you. Uh, I'm not a big fan of technical analysis. I've seen people uh, give their little demonstrations and why it's so popular and I just kind of look, shake my head. And, and interestingly enough, that was my first introduction to the world because that's what I was doing. I was building these models for these for the president of a small uh, brokerage firm. This is a million years ago. <laughs> and we would basically be not looking at anything about the company itself. We we're just looking at past price performance and volume of the, the shares that were sold, bought and sold. And I was doing the math and the, um, the programming because that's uh, my, my, my undergraduate degree is mathematics and I was a programmer. And I just kept, I just didn't understand why he thought it was so useful. And um, and that's when, and that's why I used to stay away. <laughs> I thought this is there's you know, there's nothing. What is the reasoning behind this? Where's the where's the uh, where's the? Uh... And he would say, just trust me, just trust me on this. I said, okay, well, sure, it's, you're you're paying me, I'm doing my job. And then his second in command, the vice president, she showed me a company that does fundamental analysis, 
and had done so for decades and had done very well. And I thought, you know, these are the people I want to be, I want to be a part with. So I'm a fundamentalist, not religious fundamentalist, but I'm a fundamental analysis kind of guy. So, okay, I'll tell you my, my biases right up front. Slide number six. The first one we'll tackle is actually the easier one. If you're using the book, it's the, it's the, it's not the first one they do in the in chapter six. It's actually you know at the near end of, near the end of chapter six. But I do it. We do it first because it's easier to, to do, and it's actually not the most powerful in my humble opinion. And that's financial ratio analysis. It's one method of security analysis involving looking at certain financial ratio measures. Now we've already took taken a look at a few right the price to earnings ratio and a couple other the um, couple other ratios. Um, dividend payout ratio, earnings per share. Right, financial ratios give us a quick and easy method for comparing one company to other companies within their industry or the stock market, stock market as a whole. But the problem with financial ratios is that there's no single financial ratio that it can adequately sum up or summarize the overall general state of affairs, the situation, the predicament, et cetera, that the company finds itself in. In other words, you can't just say, oh, look at this. Look at this one little number here. Look at that number. That's that. that I'm going to buy this stock because of that number. No, no, no. It's a stew. And we'll see this in in detail in our next chapter where we do uh, a lot of financial ratio analysis. The first financial ratios we will investigate will be the price ratios in this chapter. And then we'll look at others in the next chapter. Slide number seven. Do you remember the price to earnings ratio? the most popular stock market statistic. So uh, it's very simple. You take price and divide it by earnings, right? That's very simple. And you don't even have to do it because it's done for you. You just look it up on the infernal net or, or, or at the library. Um, and so we'll take, um, we'll, uh, t we'll t read at the bottom first here before we take a look at these various companies. The most popular stock market statistic P.E. ratios were in the 5 to 12 range for mature companies, 14 to 20 range for growing companies. Greater than 20 was unusual. At various times, late 1920s, late 1960s, and then in the late 1990s, greater than 20 was commonplace. Now we find that P.E. ratios are all over the map. Some are very high. Some are astronomical, right? <laughs> And then some are actually quite reasonable. So you just have to um, adapt. Because here are four companies that really have nothing more to do with themselves with each other other than they start with the letter A. I mean, that's basically the, the criteria I looked at. Just wanted to see four different companies in you know, four different industries. And so we find American Airlines, Apple, Amazon, and AMD. That's, uh, that's the competitor to Intel. Uh, they make you know, chips. Uh, microprocessors and we see that american airlines has a pe of seven which you know over the last hundred years so it was respectable anywhere from five to 15 was respectable apple has almost 25 as of 21st of february 2020 amazon is 91 91 oh my goodness that's huge and then AMD is almost twice that at 177.6. And so what are investors saying about these four companies? If we look at nothing else except for PE, and of course, we're going to look at other things. We look at just, we've just looked at price to earnings ratio. They're saying that American Airlines eh, is doing all right. We're not very excited at all about it, but it, it's okay. Whereas, ooh, we like the prospects. We collectively, we the buyers of, of uh, the investors in Apple believe that Apple's prospects are pretty darn good with a PE of almost 25. For Amazon, we believe the prospects are amazing, astounding, because we are willing to bid up the price relative to the earnings such that it is 91 times their earnings. Their price is 91 times their earnings. And AMD, Oh well, my goodness, it's going to skyrocket to the moon. And if it don't, <laughs> if the earnings do not continue to accelerate at this 
lofty uh, uh, PE? Well, folks, the parachutes had better be pretty large because there's a long way down to fall to become a regular run-of-the-mill company with a PE of anywhere from 5 to 15. Yeah, so, so PE is a measure of how excited, how, how enthused, or lack thereof, investors are about the individual company. But again, it's only one piece of information that we're looking at. Slide number eight. Historically, a PE's ratio was supposed to match its growth rate. So if the company were growing at 20% a year, which is a pretty, you know, that's a lot of growth, folks. If you grew at 20% a year in three years, you'd be twice your size. Then a PE of 20 was justified. During the internet bubble, many companies had PE ratios in the hundreds. I'll never forget this, folks. I looked down at the Quotron machine, which they're all gone. They've been replaced by internet services. But this was uh, 1998, I think. And eBay's PE was $10,000 for a time during the mania. And I just shook my head and said, this ain't going to continue. <laughs> I didn't know when it was going to end. At that PE, it would take eBay 10,000 years to earn its price. And so if we take a look down at the bottom of the slide where we say the PE ratio tells you how long it will take in years, assuming no changes in earnings, for a company to earn back its price. So a PE of 3 will take 3 years. A PE of 20 will take 20 years. A PE of 10,000 would take 10,000 years. Now, some people say, well, is that important? No, it's just something to think about. I think it's something to think about. Peter Lynch talks about it in his book that, um, that it's just something, it's not, it's, not, it's not that important. But if nothing else changes, and of course, things change every day, with a PE of three, the company will earn back that, that price in three years. A company of 20, a PE of 20 will take 20 years. So the folks in 1998 who were paying the price of eBay were thinking 10,000 years into the future. You know, forget the Y2K problem. We have to worry about the Y, you know, 10K problem when we go from four digits to five. Well, we, we none of us are going to have to worry about that problem. Anyway, typically growth stocks have high PE ratios, whereas value stocks have low PE ratios. But remember, 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 remember our discussion of growth versus value. A value stock with a low PE might not be a good value. It might be a good value. Is American Airlines a good value? I don't know. We have to do a whole lot more research. Whereas a high PE stock like Apple, like Amazon, like AMD, which is growing might actually be a good value in our eyes. So remember that, that the industry often uses the term value just to equate to low PE. But in my humble opinion, that's, that's a trap, in my humble opinion. It, 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 it sort of boxes you in and doesn't let you understand that some high growth companies are good values even if the PE is large. Make sense? I hope so. But remembering, you're taking on more risk when you do that. Slide number nine. So now how can we use the price to, I'm sorry, price to cash flow. I'm sorry, <laughs> we're not there yet. Sorry, my apologies. Price to cash flow. Uh, the current price divided by the current cash flow per share. Well, this is the same idea. Instead of looking at earnings, we're replacing earnings with cash flow. So cash flow often differs from earnings per share. What? Wait a minute. That doesn't, yes, it does. If you've taken accounting you know that there are some things that you can deduct from your earnings so you could pay fewer taxes that really are not uh, cash outlays for example depreciation and that's the that's the big example but there are other examples depreciation is not an actual cash expenditure you don't write a check out for depreciation so you get to reduce your earnings and thus pay fewer taxes fewer dollars in taxes but at the same time, those dollars are still in the company. So you'll hear people talk about good quality earnings versus poor quality earnings. And we'll discuss this, uh, this example, Lucent Technologies. 
During the internet mania, many companies were reporting record earnings, but at the same time, their cash flow was negative. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. How could that be? How could you be making record amounts of money and your checkbook is balance is going down? Well, it's actually very simple. And, and this is what happened to a company that's still around. They, they've evolved. But Lucent Technologies was spun off from the old AT&T. It used to be called Western Electric Bell Labs. It was, it was the component making part of AT&T. And they make, and I guess they still do, I don't know, I haven't followed them that much, but they made the best telephone equipment in the world. Right, and it's the 1990s, and everybody's getting a cell phone, and all these new startups need this equipment. So they went to Lucent Technologies and say, "Would you sell us two billion dollars worth of a uh, telephone equipment?" Oh, by the way, we don't have any money to pay you. We'll pay you a hundred million over the next 30 years or whatever. And Lucent Technologies said, "Okay," because these people couldn't go to a bank and ask for the two million dollars. The bank wouldn't touch them. They couldn't. Some of them could sell stock, but others couldn't even sell stock to to to. Uh, to, uh, they couldn't certainly couldn't float bonds. Nobody would buy their bonds. So they asked Lucent Technologies to be the bank. So you see what Lucent Technologies did? They said, look, we just sold $2 billion of, of equipment. Great. But we only got $100 million in the door, and we're only going to get that for the next 30 years every year, assuming this company doesn't disappear, which is exactly what happened to many of them. <laughs> And so Lucent Technologies winds up with the $2 billion of equipment, which is now already obsolete. And Lucent Technologies almost went bankrupt. In fact, their stock hit a dollar, and I kept saying, buy it, buy it, buy it. And I didn't do it, and I'm kind of glad I didn't. But it, 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 it recovered, but never to the point where it was, it was when it, at the high-flying um, late 1990s. So be careful, right? And we'll discuss the depreciation and other uh, items when we get to chapter next chapter next chapter when we look at financial statements. Slide number ten, price to sales. Uh, same idea. You take the price and divide it by the earnings. You take the price and divide it by the cash flow. In this case, you take the price and divide it by sales. Historically, a higher price to sales ratio suggested a higher sales growth, and a lower price to sales ratio suggested a lower sales growth. During the internet mania. Many analysts use price to sales instead of price to earnings or price to cash flow since most of all these new companies never generated any earnings. So, hey, look at their sales. How much money are they making? Oh, they're, they're losing you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. But look how their sales are growing. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then lastly, price to book value. Book value. We discussed that a little bit, right? Book value is what the company is worth on the books, according to the accountants. And so you look at the price of the stock and you compare it to the, price, the book, what, what the accountants say the company is worth. You take the assets and subtract the liabilities and then you divide it by the number of shares. And that says every share is worth $5, right? Or whatever it's worth. So anything historically greater than one then the shareholders believe that the firm was creating value above and beyond the physical assets of the corporation. Nowadays, it is very rare for the book price to be anywhere close to the book, book value. Why? Because companies now don't have a whole lot of assets. I mean, how much assets do, uh, do companies like, uh, like uh, uh, Apple have? Other than the fact that they have a tremendous value in the in the products that they create, they don't even build their products. Somebody else does it for them. They don't own factories. Somebody else does that. They, <laughs> you know, all the components they they, they, they buy them. They they just they they're the ones that just design them. They have a ton of cash. How about companies like uh, Google and Facebook? They don't have factories that take up entire you know cities. They just got servers sitting around the world and you know how com cheap computers are so it's very typical for the price to book value to be quite high the price the market price to be much higher than the book value exactly okay so you, so you got these four they all work the same way take the price divided by earnings take the price divided by cash flow take the price divided by sales take the price divided by book ratio so now let's see on slide number 12 
how we can actually predict future stock prices using these price ratios. Well, we're going to we're going to look take a look at slide number 12 and read this and you're going to go what? Huh? You multiply a historical price ratio by the expected future value price ratio denominator. Right? This is one of those situations in this in this chapter we're going to find the calculations are very easy. What we're actually doing is a little confusing, huh? What are we doing? And you just don't worry. Just do the calculations. You'll find they're very easy. You plug in the numbers that we tell you to use, and then you'll eventually go, oh, I see what I'm, oh, okay, I got what I'm doing. Okay, so here's from the seventh edition, and they all work the same. Assuming if you bought the book, you bought anywhere from the fourth to the, to the eighth or the ninth or wherever they're up to now, the 27th edition. They come out with a new edition whether they need to or not. So in mid-2012, the stock price of Intel was twenty, almost $27. And the earnings per share were $2.31. Now, if we go back five years, we find the average price-to-earnings ratio was a little over 17. Okay, so that's historical data. This is all data that we can find. Uh, the two dollars and thirty-one cents—that's what Intel is is uh, is earning right now. That's what they tell the world. Uh, and then we find, we go back in time and find out their PE ratio was a little over seventeen. Now here's the tricky part: the analysts or Intel or we believe that their earnings per share are going to grow next year by seven point six percent. That's future, right? We don't know if that's going to happen, but that's the expected. Uh, growth rate. So how can we look at the expected price? Well, we take the historical P.E. ratio and we multiply it by what we believe next year's earnings per share will be. So how do we do that? Take the historical P.E. ratio, because that's what it says, 17, and then we multiply it by the current earnings times 1 plus the 7.6 percent. Remember, 7.6 percent is 0 0.076, right? You understand how that works? Just divide it by 100. So our projected earnings per share is equal to the current earnings per share, $2.31, times 100 percent plus 7.6 percent, or 1.076. And we get a expected stock price of $42.50. So right now, the stock is selling for $27. If Everything stays the same, right? <laughs> the P.E. ratio stays the same. And the 7.6% uh, growth rate stays what we believe it's going to be. Doesn't mean it will, right? Then we expect the price next year to be $42.50. Do the calculation, folks. You'll see it's very straightforward, right? Pull out the 17.1. The Multiply it times the 2.31, the, the $2.31, and then times 1 plus 076. Now remember, you got to notice there's parentheses around here, right? You got to do this one first. You got to do you got to do the plus because most calculators, if you try to do the multiplication, it'll it'll do the multiplication to the one and then add the 0 0.076. So you have to do the the calc the uh, addition. You got to do that ad that addition first. Okay, do it. Did, did it work? I hope so. Okay. Because now we're going to do the exact same thing. We're going to do the exact same thing with price to cash flow. We're going to simply, remember the stock price is the same, but now here's the cash flow. Hmm. The cash flow, in, in it was, uh, what was it, $2 and, well, I forget, let's go back and find out, $2.31. But the, uh, that, was the, that was the earnings, but the cash flow was $3.65. How come the cash flow of Intel is higher than the earnings? Well, companies like Intel have tremendous, uh, what are we called, capital expenditures, which is a fancy way of saying they got to come up with a lot of money. It cost them a billion dollars to make that first chip, and the new, the new hotshot processor. But then it cost them a dollar twenty-five to make all the. <laughs> <laughs> to to make the next million chips per per chip, it take cost them a dollar or two dollars or whatever. See that that's the problem with um with uh cars the same way with cars with a lot of products. There's huge upfront costs that you have to come up with to to make the first one. 
But then once you've made the first one, the variable costs, as they're called, are very, very insignificant. So if you said to Intel, how come you're selling this chip for $500? It only cost you $5 to make it. They'll say, oh, you don't understand. You're right. Now now that we're, we've are we designed the chip and it's in production, it costs us $5 a chip, but it costs us a billion dollars to make the first darn one. So that's why the cash flow coming in the door is more because they had to depreciate all those capital expenditures. And you accountants, you know what I'm talking about, and that's why it's good to take an accounting class if we want to really like, dig deep into our investments. But you don't have to. I mean, it's, it's, it, the more accounting you, you know, the better. Wait till you get to next, our next chapter. Now, the five-year average price to cash flow, again, that's historical information that we can look up, is 8, 8.00. And again, here's the expectation for next year. We expect the cash flow to grow by 7%. So we wind up doing the exact same calculation. The eight, uh, the, the five-year average price to cash flow of 8.00 multiplied times the current uh, cash flow per share multiplied times one, whoops, 1 plus 0.07 or 1.07. And we wind up with $31.24, which is a lot different than the $42 that we saw on the previous slide. Hmm, that's going, okay, okay. Let's now try another one. So do the calculation. Stop, I'll stop. You know, you stop. Stop the presentation and do it. Make sure you can do it because it's not that hard. Make sure you get the same number. And then slide number 14. We'll do the exact same thing, but this time with price to sales per share. So again, the stock price is about $27.00. The sales per share is almost $10, and then the five-year average price-to-sales ratio is 3, and we expect the, uh, the uh, sales per share growth rate to be about 4.5%. They expect to sell about 4.5% more sales in the next year than they did this year. So we do the exact same thing. The five-year price-to-sales ratio, 3.00, times $9.99, times 1.045 gives us $31.32, which is eh, kind of close to the previous one. So what do you think? Hmm? What do you think it is? Okay, well, they're very easy to do. And, and as I said, at first you're going to say, well, what am I doing? But just do it enough times because there's worksheets and then there's assignments and then there's going to be an exam and you're going to do these and over and over and over again. Right, nod your head. Yes, I can see you nodding your head because once you've done them a few times, they're very, very simple. And then you'll pretty much understand what you're doing. Now, let's <laughs> take a reality check on slide 15. Can we reasonably assume that the formulas on the previous slides will give us realistic figures? Well, for some companies, yes, and for some companies, no. There are countless other factors at work. Remember the gentlemen who are blind all taking a look at the, you know, investigating the different parts of the elephant? It's like trying to predict the weather, only worse. The major assumption of these models is that the price multiples will remain constant. However, we are using averages without taking into account the variances and standard deviations of the averages. In other words, yeah, sure, the, the PE the last five years was whatever it was, 17 or whatever it was, um, but what did it vary from? 34 down to five, you know, just you just don't know what it's gonna be in the year that you're predicting. So is it reasonable to expect predictions from these models to be accurate if the variances of the averages are large, right? Or if our prediction for 7% growth doesn't actually happen? And the answer is no. <laughs> 16, slide 16. For the record, the price of Intel one year later in mid-2013 was about $24 which is very far from what we expected. And in the previous editions, we were way off the ma 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 map. The third edition, we predicted 
27 and a half, 31.6. The actual price was 33, so not bad. Fourth edition, we predicted $50, 43, 40, and the price was 17 and a half. Yeah, I think that was during the Great Recession. And then the prediction for chapter, for the edition, fifth edition, 25, 25, 29, and it was $20. And this, the price that predictions for the sixth edition were actually the ones that were the closest. They predicted 20.9, 20.3, and 22.7, and it was actually 20.5. The only predictions that were anywhere close to the actual prices one year later were from the sixth edition. It doesn't give you much confidence in the price models, does it? But take heart, dear students, take heart. The predictions for Disney from the book were much closer to the actual prices. And the moral of the story is, it's just one piece of information that we are uh, doing about our, our companies. It's just one thing to look at. And, and to be truthful, it's not my favorite, so I've, I've debated whether we should just not, not even do it. But I think it's important for you to see various types of, 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 of um, valuation techniques, even if we don't really put too much credence in them. Uh, there are many out there. We're only going to learn a few, and you have the rest of your life to go through and, and, and play with the others uh, if you so choose. But in our next Two presentations. Ooh, so I know you're you're kind of thinking, well, why are we doing this, Piano? You just wait. Because in our next two presentations, we are going to learn techniques that are going to tilt the odds in your favor towards companies that are not going to make you rich in the short term, but certainly aren't going to make you very sad and lose a lot of your money. So stick with us, go on, to chat, go on to the worksheets and do the first three uh, problems of each worksheet and do them over and over and over again. And you realize that, eh, you know, it's, it, it, it's not that hard to do. And, and um, so what? That it's not that powerful. It's one piece of information. But wait, just wait until our next presentation where we take a look at the dividend discount models. See you in our next presentation, dear students. I'm so excited.